This morning's gospel gives us scorching heat in more ways than one. And perhaps this seems apt for a day when it's so hot, it's safer to be inside the church rather than outside. Jesus' words in Luke's gospel are dramatic, stark, and they make for a confrontational and even painful reading. Does God expect and even intend family conflict? And is division inevitable? Perhaps Jesus is naming the deep conflicts that already exist and explaining that his message is so radical, so challenging, that it could and will cause immense conflict in the current circumstances in which he finds himself. It is not what Jesus wants, but it is likely because of the power of who and what he is, what he says, what he does. We know just how divided things will get during his own lifetime. And we know how the painful divisions amongst people at every level, from personal to international, continue to wound the world so sharply. And as we also know, many who heard Christ's message didn't merely reject it, they killed the messenger. In this passage, Jesus is not announcing a future problem. He's proclaiming a present fact and a tragic reality of the human condition in raw and revolutionary terms and inserting himself into the circumstances that already exist. He has no delusions about his present or future popularity. He has work to do, and the work like our work, will be costly. It's the work of love in a place and time in which walking life's path with love alone to light the way is always a risky choice, and it is never a romantic ideal. The fire that Jesus brings and that Jesus speaks about is holy. And perhaps in this context, another way of describing peace, as he uses it, is the way in which he says that he has not come to bring peace but division, I think here he might be using something closer to the idea of complacency. He has not come simply to collude with whatever injustice and oppression continues to crush the vulnerable. He has come with fire. He comes calling for change and willing to risk everything to bring about that change. And not everyone, as he knows and as we know, will be able to handle that. So Jesus is telling it like it is. He has come not to bring collusion and complacency, but he has come in the full knowledge that this will create further conflict in a world in which love is so hard as the black American theologian James Cone put it, there can be no reconciliation with God unless the hungry are fed, the sick are healed, and justice is given to the poor. Cone describes what he calls a sanctified person as the one who knows that their freedom is inseparable from liberation. Holding Christ's wild words alongside the passage from the letter to the Hebrews creates some serious further questions. We are presented with a list of figures in the Hebrew Bible who trusted in God and experienced liberation and sacred solidarity in circumstances of extreme danger. The Israelites in the wilderness, the pain of personal and collective rejection, the horror of torture. It's a list that is, I think, deliberately as brutal as it is triumphant. And it's vital to say that this is not supersessionist and that this passage must not be read in that way. The possibility of anti-Semitic interpretation here is a serious and a dangerous one. It would be a terrible misreading to interpret this text 
as an assertion that these people in the Hebrew Bible, God's holy people, somehow did not have access to God's love in the way that followers of Christ are offered God's love. God's love is shown to God's people in every age, again and again. A way of contending with the words that the, Hebrew re that the Hebrews reading gives to us is to see it as an invitation to continue walking with God by responding to the message that Jesus offers. There is an invitation to explore what God is doing and how. It is in the presence of Jesus as God's son, an invitation to explore unimaginable, unconditional loves of God through the incarnation in the way that God loves in so many different ways in our world. God loves for us as Christians through Jesus made human. God loves as us, God loves as we did as a human being. And the God of the Hebrew Bible is indeed the God of the New Testament, our gospels and our epistles. And in Jesus, for those who choose to follow him as Christians, the story is continuing in a specific and inspiring way. God is at work just as God has been at work. And the God who is at work is the one who speaks to us in Jesus' words this morning, when Jesus speaks so frankly about the reality of division and the pain that this causes. Jesus comes to offer unity. The alternative is a painful and oppressive cruelty with which people in families and between nations continue to treat each other. We were made for love and truly not for anything else. And that's the beauty and the risk of God's creation that Jesus refers to in our gospel. Michael Curry, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church in the United States, has described Christianity like this. I really do believe we need to see ourselves as a movement, a Jesus movement, rather than as an institution. That's what Jesus was about. He inaugurated a movement to make God's dream happen. To see ourselves this way changes everything. It means our institutional configurations must be designed to serve the movement and not the other way around. And the movement serves life. At St. James's, I can see that this movement serves life here. It is everywhere, in the liturgy, the conversations, the questions, hopes, dreams, and sorrows too. It's in the moments of deep honesty, of unvarnished reality. I've been here with you for three whole weeks, <laughs> and I can see this movement here and I am proud to come and be a part of it. As many of you may know, when Christopher Wren described this church, he explained what made it unique. He said it can hold 2,000 persons, and all can hear the service and see the preacher. I endeavored to effect this in building the parish church of St. James's Westminster, which I presume is the most capacious with those qualifications that hath yet been built. I'm told that our current capacity is nearer 500 for various reasons, but 2,000 is what Wren planned for, what his vision was, that's what he anticipated. And as one of the people on a recent Wren project tour of the church with Lucy remarked, maybe people were just smaller in the 17th century. With this vision of people gathered together in large numbers in this beautiful building with its clear glass and its serene interior, I've been thinking a lot about sacred space in relation to the idea of following light and walking in love in a costly way. On Tuesday evenings for the weekly Sanctuary Eucharist, 
The altar, just here, is covered in candles. It's beautiful. To me, they represent a community and its prayers, gathered in hope, clustering close to the broken-hearted beauty of Jesus in communion. Capaciousness, ample space for all, is a beautiful quality. Our Eucharist, Christ's Eucharist, is capacious and abundant. Here in the building, with our online global community, and in our hearts too. We are open to the world and open to God as best we can, but we also know that there is always more to experience. There's more room to grow. As the Smith sang, there is a light that never goes out. As John's Gospel proclaims in its opening words, and here I use the King James Version, which Wren would have known so well, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Each morning, I commute here on the Piccadilly Line in anticipation of starting the day with prayer in this church, in the side chapel at 8.30 in the morning. If you'd not been here for these quiet morning services, and if you can make it sometime, I warmly recommend it. There are few better ways to start the day than by renewing our commitment to be anchored in God's radical and risky love. Last Wednesday morning, during this commute, I noticed a poem by Lem Sisse, which is part of the Poems on the Underground TFL series, so you may see it too as you travel around London. It's called Dei Miracole, which is Latin for a miracle of God. Here's the poem. The spirit of structure can't be foreseen, for somewhere between the architecture and the dream, more than the sum of its parts, somehow, somewhere, the heart. I love the way this poem resonates with Michael Curry's ideas about what he calls the Jesus movement, that movement which is so life-giving. Buildings like this incredible consecrated space to which so many thousands of people are drawn and not just because of Bridgerton, buildings like these speak about the promise of love in a world where division is too often the norm. That's what this building is for, and that's what we are made for as the people who are gathered here, as people of love. Buildings speak that language of love only because the people within them, that's us, walking step by step in faith and curiosity and hope together, and the generations before us, the buildings speak that language only because we are willing to learn the language and teach its vocabulary to others. Christopher Wren was certain that this place could fit 2,000 people. Whether or not that's true today, it is most certainly a place for growth because the church is more than the sum of its parts. It's a place to discover how much more we can be with the Eucharist as God's feast for us at the heart of it all. Amen.